Um, in my talk, I will briefly give you a panoramic on how femininity got represented in the Western history of art and in the Western history of uh, thought. And I will do that uh, through the paradigmatic example of six iconic female goddess and um, divinity. So the embodiment of the divine in a female body brings with it the posing of question of sex, gender and desire at the center of the representation understanding of female divinity. As we will see in our first uh, goddess, Aphrodite or Venus in the uh, Roman tradition, the goddess of love, desire and war, um, the female body, the desire and the religious themes are in Aphrodite intertangled and connected with one another in a very significant, uh, significative way. So Venus is at the same time the object of desire, a sexual desire, but also the subject of adoration and even uh, terror. In the statue that I decide to show you, the Capitol on Venus, uh, which is a Roman copy of the Greek original statue made by uh, the Greek artist Praxiteles, the statue was is told to be the first statue in life size of a naked woman. And the legends warned that this statue had the power to turn uh, men mad. So the legends tells that a young man, for example, after having sex with the statue of Aphrodite in the temple of Aphrodite in the city of Knidos, turned mad and then killed himself by throwing his so this example, this story is an example of the ambiguous power of uh, sexual desire. Sexual desire can destroy the mind of the man and can, uh, can, and can destroy the rules of the civil world, but actually in the form of love and sexual practice uh, is of course a part of the normal functioning of the society. This ambiguity uh, of, the, of, of the goddess Aphrodite stays also in the Roman tradition. So in, in the ancient Roman, uh, the Venus was adored uh, as a public and civil goddess, but also as a private one. So in the public and civil cult of the, of the Venus, um, she was adored actually as a goddess of war. So for example, Caesar or Scylla uh, asked to be invaded by her fierce passion in order to um, defeat the enemy and to uh, win the war. So here, the passion of Venus is actually destroying uh, force. In the private cult, Venus was the god, the patroness of the married life. Uh, so a divinity for young women getting, uh, getting married and the young spouse or the young wife uh, would ask her to be blessed by the power of seduction of Venus. Here, not only the seduction of the body, but also the seduction of the mind in order to have influence in the in the in the marriage, of course, a contest that was very hardly dominated by the male. In the uh, Western history, uh, the Venus uh, stays in the symbolic uh, and the imagina in imaginary of uh, of the Western, but not as a goddess, but goddess, but actually as the prototype of uh, femininity. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I need your help. <laughs> okay. 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 Sorry. So um, she remains as the prototype of a femininity, but a kind of femininity that is acceptable uh, by the male and by the social order because she is reduced to a passive object of heterosexual male desire and the passive object of a uh, foreign male gaze. In the Venus of Urbino of Italian art, painted by Italian artist Tiziano, we see that the Venus is not a goddess anymore, but actually a young, beautiful uh, la um, lady posing naked for a viewer, which is probably a man. So she is naked, she's uh, lying down in a very erotic pose. Uh, and she has a very inviting and caressing uh, beauty and gaze. 
she is put in, in a domestic setting and even the dog uh, is a symbol for, of uh, fidelity. So here the Venus got adomesticated and she's sensual, sensual but she's uh, also very naive. So she's not unsettling, she's not dangerous, uh, she's actually very pleasing. So this adomestication of the Venus uh, is actually stays in contradiction with uh, the st her story and the story of her birth. So as we know, the, her birth is not peaceful um, at all. She was born from the castration of Uran, committed by the hand of his son, uh, Kronos. So in the Greek mythology and also in the Roman mythology, even though the Venus embodies grace, beauty and fecundity, she is born from castration, violence and conflict. So in her beauty remains and stays the threat of castration and violence. In what is probably the, the most famous um, depiction of the birth of Venus made by Sandro Botticelli, the violent root of the goddess is completely exorcised. And what remains is the archetype for an acceptable way of being a woman, an acceptable way to display the body and their own sensuality. This iconography um, uh, and this prototype is still active and significant, significant nowadays and is still used, as we can see, uh, here has been used for advertising Germany's next top model. Here, the Venus is the top model uh, Heidi Klum. And the Vena is reduced or is made the hollow older of the canonic beautiful uh, body. So a white body, a young body, a, uh, a healthy body and a slim body and so on. Um, in Greek mythology, on the very other spectrum of the grace and beauty of the Venus, we find uh, the Medusa. The Gorgon Medusa is a terrifying and powerful monster that can turn men into stone, but oddly looking at them. Also in Medusa, uh, we can find uh, um, uh, we can find the ambiguity. So she is a monster. She is dangerous. So she has to be killed. She has to be defeated. But once she is dead, she ex actually became a protector. Um, Medusa was, for example, uh, uh, depicted on the shield of the soldiers. And her head, you, you, um, we can find her head on the top of, of the roof of the houses or in, in the, on top of the door, because it was believed that she had the power to protect from evil and malevolous being. Also, her story is ambiguous because she is not uh, born as a monster, but actually uh, she was a beautiful young woman uh, that got raped by Neptune in the temple of Minerva. And then Minerva, a female goddess, Turn her, it turn her in a repelling monster because of her jealousy. Then Medusa got killed by Perseo, who uh, beheaded her while she was asleep and then used her head in order to defeat his own uh, um, enemy. In the Western tradition, as we can see in the statue uh, of Benvenuto Cellini, Perseo is depicted as a young, uh, uh, beautiful, heroic man who defeated the monster Medusa. But uh, this monster is nothing less than a woman that does not stay under the control of a man. And she is feared and she is dangerous because she has the power to kill men. She has the power to defeat uh, men. For uh, her uh, strength is not the strength of the body, it's not brutality. But um, her power is the power of, the, of seduction and uh, of her petrifying um, gaze. So uh, in the very uh, male-dominated patriarchal and misogynist uh, narration, Medusa represents a femininity that is uncontrolled and independent and, and powerful and therefore has to be uh, beheaded, has to be defeated. This, um, kind of iconography is still very um, is still very uh, contemporary as we can see here uh, is still part of pop culture this is a meme product pro, um, is a meme from the US campaign presidential campaign 2015 2016 and the modern uh, per se is Trump and the modern um, uh, Medusa is Hillary Clinton so still nowadays, um, the figure of the Medusa 
is the symbol of the fear of the men of a powerful independent uh, woman that has to be put back in place and has, has to be uh, defeated. Feminist narration, the Medusa becomes the symbol for the female rage and uh, resistance. Uh, raped and killed by an intruder, Medusa became the symbol of a femininity that is fierce, strong, dangerous, and most of all, furious. In the um, history of Western um, uh, art and thought, we can see a kind of uh, inversion of the iconography of the Medusa. Uh, for example, in narrating the biblical story of Judith, here, uh, I, I decided to show you the paint of Artemisia Gentileschi uh, because the artist Gentile Art Gentileschi in a way shares a similar past to the Medusa, being herself victim of sexual abuse. So uh, the biblical story of, uh, of Judy tells the story of Judy, which is a widow, which is important because she's another woman not subjected to the power of a man, uh, that decided to introduce herself in the enemy field in order to kill the Assyrian general Holofernes. Holofernes wanted to conquer her city. So by beheading Holofernes, Holofernes Judith saved her city and her uh, people. In this inversion of the Medusa iconography, we see two women uh, beheading an usurper. Um, if we compare the scene made by uh, a female artist, Gentileschi, with the scene depicted, with the same scene painted by a male artist, Caravaggio, we can see a clear difference of perspective. In the scene painted by Caravaggio, uh, we see uh, Judith as a young, beautiful lady who is actually scared and intimidated by the violent acts she's performing. And she's together with an old uh, servant of her who uh, um, even have the trait of the, the typical, the stereotypical trait of the witch in a way. In, Artem, in Artemisa Gentileschi uh, scene, we, we see on, uh, we, we have, uh, we uh, are confronted with a very different perspective. We see two strong, strong self-confident women and Judith is not uh, afraid of her own violence, violence and in this way she is re-giving agency to the female protagonist and maybe to Artemisa Gentileschi itself. A very, um, another very popular uh, female protagonist of the Bible is of course Eve. Uh, in the Christian tradition, Eve and the, and the naked body of Eve became the, um, the archetype of the sexual desire being the antithesis of the spiritual experience. So sexual de desire, carnal weakness uh, are features of the female in the Christian tradition and spiritual and intellectual capability are, the f are features of the male. So Eve becomes the prototype of the weakness, uh, but at the same time of the dangers of, the of femininity. She is the first woman, the first sinner, the first temptress, uh, and therefore she's representing the corrupting force of the feminine that brings to the fall of um, the man. In the Middle Ages, a very male dominant uh, narrative worked, it worked in order to condemn Eve as the only, um, as the only actor, uh, active actor of the first scene. So by blaming everything on Eve, uh, Adam was actually saved and redeemed by the first uh, scene and mistake. And the um, body uh, of e the female body of uh, of Eve became the getaway for the devil. So the the channel for the evil and demons, an open door for the uh, devil to uh, enter society. Um, the sister maybe we can say, or the anti-Eve, uh, the sister of Eve, or maybe the anti-Eve, is the figure of uh, Lilith. Lilith is a very ancient uh, demon, known also in uh, Mesopotamia, uh, that is very important in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, Jewish dem demiology, um, uh, for, for the Jewish demiology, Lilith is actually the first wife of uh, Adam. She was born uh, 
not from his rib, but actually from the same mud and earth of uh, Adam, and therefore, and therefore she was created independent, generated independent from Adam. She refuses to submit to God's will. She refuses to obey uh, to Adam, and she left uh, the Eden and Eden, and then became the spouse of uh, Satan. Lilith. Uh, is a terrifying demon that commits the most deprecable act for a woman, which is arming and killing baby and pregnant woman. In the in a feminist uh, reappropriation of the myth of Lilith, she became the symbol of uh, feminine subversion and refusal to subjugate to the patriarchal standards. So she became an icon for rebellious and subservice woman, as artist uh, Leonor Fini herself. So, Linear Fini uh, uh, wrote about herself, I know I am related to the idea of Lilith, the anti-Eve, and that my universe is that of the spirit. In her work, The Woman of the Lake, Linear Fini co confront us with this, the topic of the feminine gaze. So confront us with the problem of what it means to be at the same time the viewer and uh, the viewed. In her work, we see a naked woman emerging from a tonic landscape, and she is surrounded by uh, skulls. We know from Finit herself that these skulls are the skulls of dead men. She wrote, the men around her are dead. They are too limited in understanding, too brutal to survive. The, this woman, she is, she is in a way related with Lilith, but also to the Medusa. Her hair looked like the hair of Medusa, but most of her, her, her gaze is as uncanny and petrifying as the gaze of the uh, Medusa. She is, uh, very, um, she is very aware to be the subject of, um, to be um, yeah, the object of, uh, of um, observation, but in a very, but, um, She's not passive, but actually very active. And in this way, she's also refer. she is in contrast, she's staying in contrast with the, the Venus. She is aware of her sensuality and she's con in control of her own desire. And she's refusing the stereotype of women and also the stereotypical uh, iconography of naked women. She's not lying down. She's not canonically, she's not canonically beautiful. As I, as I said, she's very active. She's looking back in a very strong, affirmative way. Uh, you can see here the uh, broken egg shell, which is a symbol of her refusing motherhood. So she's also refusing to be uh, a mother. Everything that Lilith refuses, care giving role, uh, motherhood, uh, a, a domestic setting, compassion, are the adjectives that describe our last woman divinity, the Virgin Mary. So the Virgin Mary is uh, the merciful mother par should be an example to all uh, women. As Beato Angelico reminds us in uh, his uh, Annunciation, she's also the mirror image of Eve, her positive count counterpart. She's born free from the original sin, and she redeemed the world from the mistake of the first woman, uh, Eve. And as an exception uh, to all the other um, f um, female figures that we encounter until here, she is not sexualized. Uh, she's, of course, not naked, and she is not the object of male desire. Uh, she's actually not a woman. She's not carrying a female, a normal female body. She is a mother. So as a mother, she has to stay uh, away. She has to be, uh, she, has to, uh, she has to be purified by, uh, um, from sexual uh, desire. Her virginity before and after giving birth to Christ is actually a dogma of, uh, of the church. Um, she is accepting God's will and she, uh, I don't have time for that. Sorry, I have to skip. So, uh, she is accepting God's will and um, she is accepting her role as uh, the mother of, um, uh, of God. And because of her obedience and acceptance, she, 
we can say that Mary is not actually an icon uh, of feminism, but uh, uh, because she has all, uh, um, um, always been seen as actually the perfect icon of the patriarchal wish and expectation um, about uh, about uh, women. As Simone de Beauvoir vo uh, wrote in her groundbreaking text, Second Se Sex in 1959, for the first time in history, the mother kneels before her son. She freely accepts her inferiority. This is a supreme masculine victory consummated in the cult of uh, the Virgin. Um, so I see that I'm running out of time, so I will just skip to the conclusion. <laughs> so um, the six female icons uh, here uh, presented have been defined, depicted and narrated predominantly by uh, men. They therefore often reduced and simplified in order to fit the expectation and standards of a patriarchal society and history. But at the same time, they, they were and they still are the subject of female and feminist reappropriation of uh, their narrative, returning them the ambiguity and complexity inherent in this divine and demonic figure, showing also the liberating and affirmative potential of uh, feminine power. Thank you.